Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, everybody's got their refreshment ready to go. I would love to introduce introduce our speaker. Scott Weidensall is the author of more than two dozen books on natural history, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist Living on the Wind and his latest, the New York Times bestseller, A World on the Wing. Weidensall is a contributing editor for Audubon, a columnist for Birdwatcher's Digest, and writes for a variety of other publications, including Living Bird. He is a fellow of the American Ornithological Society and an active field researcher studying softwet owl migration for more than two decades, as well as winter hummingbirds, bird migration in Alaska, and the winter movements of snowy owls through Project Snowstorm, which he co-founded. I'm very, very pleased and grateful to Scott. Welcome, Scott. And it would help, thank you. It would help if I unmuted myself. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, very much, Becky. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be back again, and um, and to talk and to talk this time about one of my favorite subjects, which is northern sawwood owls. Um, I've been I've been messing around with northern sawwood owls. This is actually my twenty seventh year of banding sawwood owls. The twenty five years um, this year for the the big project in Pennsylvania that we've been doing through the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art, which is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about this evening. So um, bear with me for a second here while I do the screen share shuffle and, um, oops, I think I've done this enough times. And Becky, give me a thumbs up if uh, you see that title slide. Excellent, super, super. Well, it's, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here this evening again and, uh, and a pleasure to talk about one of my favorite subjects in the world, which are tiny little owls the size of soda cans. Um, I've, been, I've been messing around with birds, you know, practically my entire life. And particularly raptors, I got hooked on raptors at an early age. I got involved with bird banding though, um, back in the mid 1980s um, at Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, um, banding diurnal raptors and uh, actually ran Hawk Mountain's banding program for a while. I mean, and that's just, I, I have to say that is still one of the most addictive things I've ever done, you know, basically it's like fly fishing in the sky, luring birds down. Um, I don't do much diurnal raptor banding anymore, although I really enjoy the opportunity to like, for example, catch Swainson's hawks with Bill Clark down in the, in the Texas borderlands. But back in the mid 19, um, in the mid 1990s, I got hooked on sawwood owls. And I mean, all I have to do is, I mean, look at that face. How can you not get hooked? on a bird like that. Um, although if I were to be perfectly honest about it, the reason I got started on banding sawwood owls is because I was trying to impress a woman. Um, I, was, I was dating a woman who had um, a, a five-year-old daughter who really loved birds. And I knew um, some colleagues of mine in Pennsylvania, um, Eric and Melanie Atkinson had started banding sawwits in their backyard near Hawk Mountain. And I asked if we could tag along with them one evening. And um, six months later, that relationship was over. And 27 years later, I'm still still messing around with solid owls. And the uh, thing is, I think, can I interrupt you for just a quick moment? Um, we realized we forgot to um, mention our question and answer procedure for tonight. Oh, of, of course, Susan, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I just want to let people know that if you have questions during the presentation, you should um, use the Q&A button on Zoom and that will open up a special Q&A window and we can track questions from there. Ask your questions right through the program and we'll hold off on submitting them to Scott until the end. Um, if there's any that we can answer, you know, that we know the answer that we can help, um, we'll help do that kind of as we go. But um, feel free to submit those questions and answers and we'll, we'll save a little bit of time at the end and try to make sure that we address those. So sure. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's fine. Thank that's so fine, much. Susan. And, and, and I, I assume that with the, the Q&A function here, the people can upvote questions. If they see a question that somebody else has asked and they really want to get an answer to that too, you can upvote it and it kind of goes to the top of the list. I did so not know that. Yeah, that's something that it makes it makes it easy for people to kind of vote on what the most popular questions are. Nice. So, um, Thank you. Or, or, or the ones that are going to stump the chump. That's that's always a lot of fun, too. Um, so the, the thing about sawwood owls is that um, they until relatively recently, we've known relatively little about them. They're a fairly common widespread bird, as you can see from the from the range map. 
Um, they, they breed, you know, kind of up to the, the edge of the northern, the northern edge of the boreal forest. Um, to be honest with you, this range map, um, which is from my book on North American and Caribbean owls, so I'm responsible for this, it, it realistically ought to have a whole lot of question marks down along, say, the Gulf Coast and, uh, and down into Mexico. Um, we know where these birds breed. We have a very poor understanding of what the southern limits of their, of their breeding range, of their, uh, their wintering range actually are. And until relatively recently, this, you know, this is a bird that was considered quite rare in many parts of its range. When I started working with northern sawwood owls in Pennsylvania in the mid-90s, they were listed as a candidate species for enda state endangered species protection. Because, you know, let's face it, most birders go a lifetime without seeing a sawwood owl, or maybe they see one or two. Um, they're, they're a very rare, they're a very rarely seen bird, but it turns out they are not at all rare. Um, during the summertime, they breed in the, um, the northern hardwoods and uh, mixed boreal forests of the northern United States and Canada, and all the way down uh, the spine of the Appalachians in the east, down into the Smokies. And as you saw a moment ago in that range map, in the mountains of the west, all the way down into central um, and southern Mexico. Um, there, are, uh, there are breeding populations of sawwood owls on some of the high volcanic mountains in southern Mexico. Um, where they're existing in, in, for the most part, pine and oak forests that aren't all that different from the places they breed farther north. And then um, starting in mid-September up in the north and continuing through about Thanksgiving into Christmas some years, um, they start moving south. And we knew, we've known probably since the turn of the, ninth, uh, the, turn of the 20th century that sawwood owls are migratory. John James Audubon thought that they were um, permanent residents as far south as Louisiana. I mean, he, he, he named them Acadian owls because he thought they nested in Louisiana. They make it down there in the wintertime, but they're certainly not breeding there. Um, so as the leaves start to, start to change and start to drop, these birds start moving south. And in fact, in many parts of at least Eastern North America, the peak of their migration coincides with, um, with leaf fall. During, during the autumn. Um, we tend to associate them, I think birders tend to associate them with coniferous habitat, and they certainly do roost in conifers um, a lot in the wintertime. But um, some of the radio telemetry that we've done, which I'll talk about in a little bit, has shown that they actually preferentially roost high up in the, in the, in the canopies of large hardwood trees when those trees still have their leaves on. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Pennsylvania was considering this bird for endangered species list protection. And um, in fact, it is the symbol of the Pennsylvania Wild Resource Conservation Program, which is a, uh, the big non-game program there. So um, it's, it's kind of nice when you're a sawwood alabander to be able to drive around with a car that has your study subject on the license plate. When we started working with sawwets in the mid-90s, as I said, they were really very much an enigma. Um, you know, the, the, the number of sawwood owls reported by birders in any given year was, was probably in the single to low double digits. Um, and yet when we started banding these birds, when we started um, setting up mist nets in the woods and playing an audio lure, a recording of the male's um, toot vocalization as uh, the male advertisement call, you know, we started catching these things by the hundreds. Um, and it turns out that, as I said, you know, they're, they're not rare, they're just rarely seen. And in fact, this is arguably one of, if not the most common and widespread small forest raptor in North America. Now, the program that, that I've been overseeing for the last 25 years is through an organization called the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art in central Pennsylvania. It's located in Millersburg, about half an hour north of Harrisburg. And um, we launched this program through the Ned Smith Center in 1997. Uh, we have um, 20 licensed banders that work under my federal and state bird banding permits. Um, about another 85 crew members. Um, we call them volunteers, but frankly, we're all volunteers. None of us get paid for this. And over the course of the last 25 years, we've banded more than 12,000 northern sawwood owls, showing that these are not at all a rare bird. Um, we have three long-term stations um, that have been operating since the late 1990s or early 2000s. Um, two of them, Hidden Valley and Small Valley, are along the, uh, the Appalachian Ridge and Valley system. Um, um, Hidden Valley is actually a golf course, and we, we work um, in the forested mountain slopes just above the course itself, and we band in this lovely old log lodge that they have. Small Valley is a Girl Scout camp with um, a couple thousand acres. And then we have our Kings Gap site at Kings Gap State Park in south central Pennsylvania, which is on uh, the very northern tip 
of South Mountain, which becomes the, uh, the Blue Ridge province of the Appalachian system. You know, it's, it's continues on south and eventually you know, merges into the, uh, into the Blue Ridge Mountains. And our project is part of a much larger network called Project Alamo, um, which was founded by my good friend and colleague, Dave Brinker from Maryland's Department of Natural Resources in 1994. And I have to confess that this, this map is woefully out of date. Um, we're actually in the process now of gathering all the information uh, to get a, a much more comprehensive map, but there's now about 125 collaborating OWLNET stations across North America from Alaska all the way down into the mountains of Mexico. Um, as you can see, concentrated primarily around the Great Lakes and in the, in the east, although that is increasingly, we're getting increasing um, coverage out west, and many of these stations banned more than just sawwood owls. Some of the Rocky Mountain stations also banned flammulated owls, um, a number of the Canadian stations, um, and some of the Rocky Mountain stations banned boreal owls as well. Um, some of them banned long-eared owls. Um, some of us end up catching barred owls, although we'd really rather not because the barred owls have a tendency to come in and try to eat the sawwet owls. As I said, um, we're, we're misnetting these birds at night during the migration season. Our stations um, open at the beginning of October and we run seven nights a week um, every rainless night until uh, the week of Thanksgiving. And we are what's known as a constant effort misnetting operation, meaning we run the same number of nets in the same location at the same, for the same number of nights. You know, we, we don't change anything about the way we operate year after year after year after year. So that as we see changes in the numbers of owls that we're catching, um, that's a reflection we believe of changes in the actual number of owls that are migrating south. So um, at our three stations, we have three 40 foot long mist nets set up in the woods. We open the nets um, just at dusk at, at civil twilight, usually about half an hour after sunset. And we have an audio lure that is broadcasting the advertisement toot of a male sawwet owl at about 80 decibels. And we can hear it three quarters to a mile away. We assume the owls can hear it much, much farther than that. And for reasons we don't really understand, they're attracted to that sound. Um, they're drawn in and investigate. I, I can only imagine that they think this is like the biggest sawwet owl they've ever heard and they've got to take a look at this thing. But for whatever reason, um, they, they, they come in um, and we do regular net checks, take the birds out of the, out of the net, take them down to our banding station. In non-pandemic times, we welcome visitors to a couple of our banding stations, particularly Hidden Valley. We, we love sharing these little owls with, with other people. Um, and there's this moment um, when the owl pops out of the, the, the bag for the first time. We call it, um, we always warn people that there's an infectious disease issue. When people go, oh, avian influenza? And we're like, no, 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 it's the cute virus. You, know, you take one look at that little face. And I have seen the roughest, toughest raptor biologist people that rappel down cliffs into golden eagle nests go, all right, let me see this little, oh my God, it's just so cute. Um, people just kind of go to mush when they see these things. Um, of course, the first thing that we want to do is put a, a numbered leg band on the bird. And those leg bands, that's the only thing that we get from the federal government. Those of you who are familiar with bird banding know what I'm talking about. Um, each one has a, a, a sequential, unique nine digit serial number that you know, will not be replicated on any other bird band um, anywhere in the world. Um, pop that, that band on the leg, it'll stay on there for the rest of the bird's life. It, it slides up and down the leg, it rotates, doesn't hurt the bird in the slightest. So now we've marked this bird as an individual. And if this bird is ever found again, if it's ever captured by another bander or found dead on a road or whatever, you know, we, we, can, we can start to connect the dots on how far these birds move, what roots they're using, how long they live, whether they come back to the same place in the spring, whether they come back to the same place in the fall. We also need to know how old the bird is. And so after banding it, the first thing we do is we age the bird. And we do that by looking at the flight feathers um, on, the, uh, on the wings of the owl. Um, the only time a bird grows all of its feathers at the same time is when it's chick in the nest. And um, over the course of time, it takes about three or four years for an owl to replace all of the feathers in its wings. So if you get a bird like this, where all the feathers are bright and glossy and new and shiny and richly colored, there's no signs of fading, there's no contrast between new feathers and old feathers. We know this is a young bird that was born the previous, this previous summer, just you know, four, four or five months earlier. This is what we call a hatching year bird. On the other hand, if we open up the wing and we see that, where you've got a mix of very new glossy dark feathers with a, a number of, 
of old faded feathers, both in the, uh, in, the, in the flight feathers, the primaries and the secondaries, but also up in the, in the coverts higher up in the wing, we know that that's an adult owl. Um, that this bird is, in this, in this case, this bird is at least three years old. It's what we call an after second year bird. Now, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to distinguish um, the ages of the feathers in visible light, you know, looking at it with a headlamp. But fortunately for us, owls glow in the dark. If you turn off all the lights and you turn on a, a UV light, a black light, um, the underside of the wings glows neon raspberry. That is not Photoshop right there. That is actually what it looks like. And what you're seeing is a, a pigment called porphyrin. It's actually a class of pigments. And porphyrins are a breakdown product of hemoglobin from the bird's blood. It's broken down in the liver and it's a, it's a red brown pigment. And a lot of birds use porphyrins to, um, to pigment their eggs. If you've ever seen um, a house wren egg, it's speckled with, uh, with red brown, it's porphyrin. Um, well, porphyrins fluoresce under ultraviolet light. It's probably just a little happy biochemical accident, probably doesn't serve any purpose that we can think of, but owls and a number of other groups of birds like nightjars and taracos, um, they repurpose that, that pigment for their feathers. And so um, if you shine a black light on those feathers, not only can you see that they glow, but the newer feathers glow much more brightly, they fluoresce much more vividly. And so in this case, you see that the outermost primaries at the end of the wing and the innermost secondaries close to the body are new and the middle primaries and secondaries um, are considerably more faded. This is a second year bird. This is a bird that was born the previous summer in the, in the previous calendar year. Um, and so this is, you know, I, I like to joke that this is a, a combination of serious ornithology and a cheap party trick because I love, you know, turning off the lights, opening up the wing of the owl, turning on the black light and people just gasp. Now you may have heard a lot in the news in the last year or so about other animals fluorescing under ultraviolet light from, from puffins to flying squirrels to platypuses to, um, to some species of frogs. Um, I gotta say, I'm a little bit peeved because most of these studies have not referenced the fact that we were doing this with owls back in the, and banders were doing this with owls back in the 1980s. The owls were one of the first animals that were recognized to be fluorescent. And, um, and I have to say, like you see that headline on the Puffin um, article about how it may help them attract the opposite sex. The birds can't see this unless they are in a dark room and have a black light themselves. So no, this is really not helping puffins um, pick up chicks. Um, it's just, I really do think it's kind of a happy little biochemical accident where the, the animal or the bird's body is repurposing those pigments for, um, for other purposes. And it just happens like some minerals glow under, under UV light. It doesn't serve a purpose to that mineral. Anyway, once we figure out what, um, how old the bird is, we, we sex them by looking at how much they weigh and the length of their wing. Female sawwet owls are about 25% larger than males, although there's a fair, bit of, um, a fair bit of overlap. We take a whole series of measurements. Uh, we look at, at um, uh, you know, the length of the bill, the length of the, 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 the wing, uh, the color of the eye. We have found a, a strong correlation between um, the color of the eye, the amount of white in the face of the owl, and the physical condition of the bird. Birds that are in better physical condition have much more vividly yellow-orange eyes, um, and they also have a lot more white in the face. And this is actually the first time on any species of bird in the world where scientists have been able to determine that plumage color, the feather color, is an indication of the, uh, the overall health of the bird. So the whole banding process, you know, if we're really cranking, if we've got a busy night, we can get one of these birds processed in about five or six minutes. And then we take them outside. We hold them in the dark for about five minutes to let their eyes readjust to the dark. Um, and then we let them go. And that five minutes is not an arbitrary number. We actually had a graduate student from Franklin and Marshall College some years ago who spent the entire fall at our banding station with a very elegant um, experiment. She had... Uh, she built a release box um, with a plexiglass roof to let ambient light in with a couple of um, LED headlights in the back, actually the same ones that are used on Amish buggies because they don't produce heat. Um, and they would it would produce exactly a, the, the same amount of light that the, the desk lamp that we use at the banding table produced. And so after we finished processing a bird, it would go into this release box and 
um, Ariel had like a randomized, um, a little randomized system so that the bird would get anywhere from zero to 30 minutes of darkness in, in the, um, or in the, in the cage after it was exposed to the same level of light under the, under the, uh, the banding on the banding table. And then the light would go, the light would go out, it would wait from zero to 30 minutes. And then she could automatically open the door from a distance and observe the birds with night vision um, videography. And in front of the box were a couple of those foam floaties that people use in, in swimming pools that were set up as obstacles so that if the, if, if the bird had reacquired its night vision, when it flew out of the box, it would be able to weave around those floaties. But if it flew into them, they weren't going to do any harm. And basically what you found out is after five minutes in the dark, the birds could see perfectly well. So one of the things that we have found over the last 25 years is that sawwood owls are highly cyclical. The number of, of owls coming south every year um, varies tremendously from year to year. And on a, an every other year cycle with about a, a roughly four or five year cycle embedded within that with, with really big spikes. Now, I want to, I want to, back up a little bit here because we, we tend to talk about these as eruptions, like this is going to be a sawwood owl eruption year. And it's really not. I mean, eruptions like those um, in northern hawk owls or great gray owls are driven for the most part by hunger. These are adult owls coming south from their subarctic um, breeding range or boreal breeding range because prey populations have collapsed and they don't have enough to eat. Sawwood owls, that's not what's happening. What's happening with sawwood owls is the previous year, uh, the previous autumn, um, there was a cone crop across Canada, either large or small or completely absent. If it's a really big cone crop in the fall of one year, that's going to drop trillions and trillions of conifer seeds, spruce and, and balsam fir and hemlock seeds, which provide food for small mammals like red-backed voles. And so the vole population explodes. And all of those rodents the following summer provide food for owls and you get lots and lots of baby sawwood owls. This is a juvenile sawwood owl and I'm still in its juvenile plumage. Sawwood owls in a poor rodent year may not breed at all, where they may only have a, a handful of chicks. In a big rodent year, a female sawwood owl can lay as many as 11 to 13 eggs and then will sometimes abandon that nest when the chicks are about half grown, leave them with, leave them with dad and go off with another male and start a second brood. So you get these huge surges in populations, but it's not really an eruption. It's just an awful lot of babies coming in uh, into the population. The number of adults um, from year to year uh, migrating south is pretty, um, is pretty stable. I will say that most of the, of the adult owls that we catch overwhelmingly are females. Um, the males that we catch are almost entirely juvenile males on their first, um, on their first migration. So we get about 65 to 70% females. The remainder are, are males or they're birds that we can't distinguish. You know, they're, they're in that in-between zone and we just have to put them down as sex unknown. Adult male sawwet owls, we think, simply remain up on the breeding territories in the north over the winter and don't migrate. They may shift around the breeding territory, um, trying to find a place where the rodent populations are high so they can set up a territory and be ready when the females come back in the, um, in the springtime in, uh, in, in March and April. But they appear not to be significantly migratory. Out of 12,000 sawwets that we've banded in Pennsylvania, we have caught exactly 12 fully adult males. So literally they are one in a, one in a thousand. And this is what it looks like when it's a big year. That is one hour's worth of owls at one of our stations in the fall of 2012, which was the last big, really big flight that we had. Um, that year, we ran our three stations, our three full-time stations that we always run. We ran six experimental stations, um, and we caught almost 4,000 owls that year. So as I said before, not at all um, a rare species. The following year, we caught fewer than 200. <laughs> because it was a down year. So, you know, this up and down and up and down stuff um, is, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it can be a little bit frustrating. So there's a lot that we can learn from banding. You know, we've, we've, we've determined that the average um, lifespan for sawwood owl is about three and a half years. We know a lot about their migration routes. Um, uh, we know they're, they're, they do not show a lot of um, 
return fidelity to the same breeding sites or the same wintering sites, but there's only so much you can learn from banding. So over the years, we've experimented with a lot of other technologies to learn more about solid owls. Um, during the early 2000s, we spent about 10 years doing really intensive radio telemetry um, using little um, radio transmitters that, as you can see, were um, about as big as a penny and weighed even less. We fitted them with little, uh, little backpack harnesses um, around the owl's wings. And the harnesses were made out of like stretch beading cord, like you'd make a kid's necklace out of, but they had a breakaway section um, with uh, made of, uh, of plain old cotton um, sewing thread, which eventually will rot through and the whole thing will fall off um, some months after the bird um, has left our area. And our, our interest initially was to find out more about their roosting behavior. And so um, working at our uh, near our King's Gap banding station in South Central Pennsylvania on South Mountain, over the course of about Oh, seven or eight years, we, we tagged more than 40 solid owls and would track them to their daytime roosts um, and collect a lot of information about the, uh, the habitat that they were using, the, the structure of the forest where they were roosting. One of the things we noticed was that the roost sites were often fairly close to water and in areas where there was a lot of dense understory. And so we assumed that what the birds were doing were finding roost sites in places where there were lots of rodents so that they could hunt off their roost. But in, um, starting in, the, in the, the fall of 2007, we undertook what is still probably the, well, not probably, the most arduous research project I've ever been involved in, which was doing nighttime triangulation telemetry, where we were following the, the movements of an individual owl all night long as it was moving around its territory. And we did that by having, a, having teams of um, three trackers, each with a handheld radio receiver and a directional antenna. And starting with the bird on roost before dark, we would kind of spread out roughly about a, you know, a quarter mile away from the owl. And every 10 minutes from dusk until dawn, um, in com radio communication with each other to make sure that we're all doing it at exactly the same time, we would take a bearing on where, this, where the radio signal was strongest. And you know, you'd, take a, you'd take a compass bearing and the GPS point. Anyway, you could plot these things and where the lines um, of those bearings intersect, that's where the bird is, that's how you triangulate. And we just do this again and again and again and again and again, night after night after night for months. And one of the things that we found was that the owls are certainly not choosing their roost sites based on their hunting um, preferences because they never hunted anywhere near their roost sites. In fact, some of them were traveling as much as three miles away from their roost site to do their hunting and then flying, like and one of them was flying from the top of the ridge, three miles down into the valley, hunting in a woodlot on a small dairy farm and then commuting back up to the top of the mountain the next night. And what you see here is the activity range over the course of a couple of weeks for one sawwood owl. Each night is a different color and altogether, that bird was using about 1,500 acres, which for an owl that weighs about as much as a robin and is the size of a soda can, um, is a remarkably large territory. Um, we, we, we really, um, at almost every turn, saw what owls have surprised us. Now, it would, it would really be great if we could follow these birds in their migration with these little radio transmitters on, but the fact of the matter is, um, it's, it's almost impossible to follow a bird like that in real time with a small radio transmitter, you know, a, a small owl at night flying through mountainous terrain. You can't really do that unless you have an Air Force, and we do not have an Air Force. But we did take advantage of a newly emerging technology about uh, 10 or 15 years ago um, called light-sensitive geolocation. Um, you may have heard about geolocators. Um, they're, they're, they're not transmitters, they're data loggers. So all they do is record data and you've got to get that owl back again to download the data from the, from the data logger in order to find out um, where it's been. So in the, in the fall of 2009, we started deploying um, geolocators on migrant sawwood owls that we were catching in Pennsylvania. And we were reasonably certain that we would get um, at least a significant number of these back because northern sawwood owls have a very high recapture rate at other banding stations about probably around 12 to 15% of the owls that we banned are recaptured again in subsequent years. Um, that is a, an astoundingly high number. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, songbird banding stations, you know, they may band 100,000 songbirds over the course of the years and never recapture 
um, a banded bird from another station in all of that time. Um, it, it, at the peak of the migration season, it is rare for us not to catch one or two banded birds a night um, at one of our three stations. Um, so we, uh, we, released these, we released these owls, we waited to see what would happen, and we got relatively few of them back, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Um, most of the owls we were tagging were juvenile owls because it was a big flight year. Um, it was a particularly bad winter that year in the mid-Atlantic with very deep snow and a lot of ice cover. And we suspect a lot of the owls did not survive. Um, also, juvenile birds don't have a particularly high survival rate. Um, a number of the geolocators we got back were either from birds that had not really moved all that far. And geolocation doesn't give you a precise location. It gives you like plus or minus 120 miles. So, you know, we had saw what owls that were recaptured in Western Pennsylvania that didn't really tell us that much. Um, we did get one owl, however, that was recaptured, not the next year, not the year after that, but the year after that. A bird, a bird that was recaptured in Southern Virginia with three complete migration cycles on its data logger, which was really remarkable because the battery was only supposed to last for two years. Um, and that one bird gave us a huge amount of information. Um, so um, if, you, if you look there, the, the deployment location at, uh, um, at our Small Valley site, was, it was deployed in October of uh, 2009, spent that first winter in Western Virginia, and then it migrated north up into um, Southern Ontario or, or Western Quebec, nested that winter, came south into somewhere around the panhandle of West Virginia, and then the next spring only went up into Western Pennsylvania, or Central Pennsylvania to attempt to nest. And I say attempted to nest because partway through the nesting season, um, it abandoned its nest there. Um, the geolocators function by recording light levels, and we can tell exactly when the owl starts to incubate because it goes into a tree cavity. It's the only time that saw wood owls go into tree cavities, and there's total darkness, so there's no light at all. And then after about three weeks, um, suddenly the bird abandoned that nest and moved in that same breeding season up into um, the Adirondacks, the southern edge of the Adirondacks or near the Catskills, where it re-nested. Birds are not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to move hundreds of miles during the same breeding season and re-nest. Um, she, uh, she spent the next winter um, in Northern New York. Um, these dots on the map are just approximations. She was somewhere in Northern New York, close to the Canadian border. And then that next winter, she went down into Western Virginia again, where she was recaptured in November of 2012. So only one bird, but we got an amazing amount of information from her. And you can see that sawwood owls show basically no faithfulness, no fidelity to either their breeding locations in the summertime or their wintering locations. And that again is not typical of most birds. I have been asked more times than I can count by um, people doing wind development or concerned about the impact of wind development on migratory birds at what altitude do saw wet owls migrate at night? And we don't know. I mean, we're luring them down out of the sky into our nets, but we don't know if we're pulling them down from treetop level or 2000 feet overhead. One of my colleagues, who I think is wrong, believes that they migrate under the tree canopy, but I have no way of proving that he's wrong. So in the fall of 2011, we decided to try to combine two technologies to see if we could answer this question. We, we decided we were gonna to try to use forward-looking infrared. Um, these, it was a $40,000 infrared camera that we rented and took very, very care, good care of that would allow us to, to spot and track individual migrating birds in the night sky. Um, birds are warmer than the night sky. So on, on infrared, they show up brilliantly well and in, in, a, in a great deal of detail. So we thought we could identify sawwood owls as they're flying over by their, their shape and their profile. And then we would be able to track their flight speed and altitude and movements using this vertical beam radar array that we rented from the Cape May Bird Observatory from, from New Jersey Audubon, along with a New Jersey Audubon radar technician, because I have absolutely no idea how to run radar. Um, and you can, see the, um, you can see the radar screen right there. And all of those little blue and orange dots are birds flying overhead. It was a beautiful theory and it didn't work. 
And the reason it didn't work is because the infrared camera would allow us to see the birds in sufficient detail to identify them out about a thousand feet. You see that big orange blob in the middle of the screen? That is what's known as the bang. It's a big bubble of high energy that surrounds the radar unit out about a thousand feet. So if the bird was close enough to see on infrared, it was too far away to see on radar. And if it was, if it, if it was far enough away to see on radar, it was too far away to see on infrared. It was, it was a lovely idea. I think with changing technology in a couple of years, it might actually be possible to do that. But you know, that's the way science goes. You, you try things, um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In the fall of 2012, we decided to try another newly emerging technology. It's what's known as nanotag technology. Uh, with these tiny, tiny, tiny little um, VHF radio transmitters, which unlike the transmitters that we had used earlier, which each, each transmitter broadcasts on a different frequency. So you, you identify the owl you're, you're tracking by knowing the frequency that the thing is broadcasting on. These nanotags all broadcast on the same frequency, but they broadcast a unique coded identification pulse that allows you to tell one individual bird from the other. And so we set up four automated receiver stations on, on ridgetops in South Central Pennsylvania um, with overlapping areas of, um, of coverage, as you can see in that, in that map at the bottom, that covered part or all of them at an 11 county area. And then we tagged 40 or 50 solid owls that fall at one of our stations and um, we were able to track their movements. It was really successful. Um, what also happened that year was that we heard about um, a project that Birds Canada, what, they, what in those days was known as Bird Studies Canada, had launched using the same technology up at their Long Point Bird Observatory um, on the North Shore of, um, of Lake Erie. And a year or two later, Birds Canada launched what, they, what is now known as the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, where it's combining, again, these tiny, tiny little nanotag transmitters that are literally, some of them small enough to put on monarch butterflies and migratory dragonflies. Um, with automated receiver stations and, um, and track these, these creatures across landscape distances. It's really revolutionizing our understanding of bird migration. And so my, my good friend, Dave Brinker, the fellow who founded Project Alnet and with whom I was doing that, um, that nanotag study, we and a number of other colleagues at the Willistown Conservation Trust and the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh um, formed something called the Northeast MODIS Collaboration. And we've been working with Birds Canada to build out the MODIS network um, across primarily in our case, across the Mid-Atlantic and now New England. Um, by the time we're done at the end of 2023, we will have built about 150 of these automated receiver stations from Maryland and Delaware, all the way up through, um, through Maine. And if you're at all interested, I'd encourage you to go to the MODIS website. It's just motus.org. Um, all of those yellow dots are, um, are MODIS sites. You can click on any of them on the MODIS website and find out what species have been going past there. You can, if you're interested in common nighthawk migration, for example, you can, you can create maps like this that shows, show you where these birds have gone. Um, we have been actually sitting on a significant sum of money for about the last, at this point, almost 10 years, waiting for the MODIS network in the East to be built out to a sufficient um, extent. And probably in the fall of 2023, we are going to be tagging something on the order of about 400 solid owls across um, Southern Canada and the United States um, to track their movements and find out, well, for one thing, find out where these, these male owls are going. Um, you know, for the, for the first time. Um, yeah, it's a, it, MODIS is a really incredible project and it's, it's being used to study um, an, awful, an, awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of animals out there besides, um, besides solid owls. So we've been doing this now for 25 years and um, we've answered an awful lot of the questions that we started out with. I used to joke um, when I was at our banding station that somebody would ask, ask me a question and I'd say, you know, I, have a little, I should have a little sign around my neck that says, I haven't the faintest idea because that was often the answer to whatever question they happened to be asking me. Um, you know, that's not exactly the case today. We've been able to answer a lot of questions and learn a lot about this, um, this most mysterious and smallest of Eastern forest owls. Um, but we have a lot of questions left. One of the really important questions that we have recently been able to answer because um, many of these Project Alnet sites have been in operation now for more than 20 or 25 years, 
And because, as I said, we're, we're using this constant effort misnetting um, approach where you know, we're not changing our protocol from year to year, we've got um, rigorous data that are, that are comparable to each other. And so last year, um, a, a number of us partnered together and published a paper um, in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology looking at 25-year um, population trends in solid owls. Our, you know, one of the questions I've been asked for years is, how are solid owls doing? Are, um, is the population going up? Is it going down? Are they in trouble? Are they in danger? Are they stable? Um, and so we took data from, um, uh, from seven stations, from Tadoussac up on the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, all the way down to um, uh, Castleman and Assateague in, uh, in, in Maryland, and crunched the numbers. And it would appear that solid owl populations are stable, are fairly stable. We found a a small, um, non-significant decline over the course of the 25 years. But I will say that those of us at the southern end, as particularly Dave Brinker's Assateague site down in Maryland, you know, kind of anecdotally, we don't seem to be getting quite as many owls as we did 25 years ago. The peaks are not reaching as high. Dave, Dave likens it to like a receding tide. You know, the waves are still coming in, but they, they don't go quite as far up the beach each time. And that, there could be a couple of reasons for that. Um, it, could, it could reflect a, a genuine decline in solid owl numbers. And we're gonna, by the way, we're gonna, we're gonna revisit our data set and, and look at how population trends may, be, may differ north to south along that, along that uh, gradient. But it's also possible that these birds are just simply short stopping. You know, we know that that some species of migrant birds are doing that. Certainly, waterfowl do that. They just may not be coming quite as far south um, as they once did. Um, but I can tell you one thing for sure: we are not going to give up banding sawwood owls anytime soon. Um, we have a lot of questions that we want to that we want to ask. You know, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm really excited about the potential for um, looking uh, at at um, you know, literally the migrations of hundreds of sawwood owls um, that we can tag using the MODIS network. Um, we've got one of my um, owl banding volunteers from Pennsylvania is a professor at uh, York College of Pennsylvania. He's been doing a lot of genetic work on sawwood owls. There are some folks, actually some folks in the Midwest just published a great paper looking at um, origin points of sawwood owls using stable chemical isotopes in their feathers. Um, you know, there's new technologies emerging all the time that allow us to go back and ask questions that even a few years ago we might not ever have been um, might not even have thought to ask and so um, and you know after all look at that face um, I, I i can honestly say that every saw wet owl i catch today um, is as exciting to me as the first ones that i caught uh, more than a quarter of a century ago um, this is this is one aspect of ornithology with with me that just does not get old and so with that i'll uh, i'll, I'll wrap things up here. If we've got time, we can, we can take some questions. I'm, I'm, I, will, I will answer questions until people beg me to stop. Um, so let me stop screen sharing here. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed that. Scott, right, here's a question. Um, one of our listeners was wondering, when you said that you hadn't been uh, netting any male owls and you theorize that they just stay on their territory, mm -hmm. He was wondering, could it be that the sound that you're playing <laughs> only attracts females and not males? Yes. So um, that's 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 um, a, a very good question, um, and we can say that there is definitely um, a gender bias because of that male advertisement call. But we also know, see, the the audio lure is a. Well, at this point, I wouldn't. I don't think we can. I can't call it a recent innovation. But um, people started banding sawwood owls in Wisconsin in the 1960s. And it wasn't until the mid to late 80s that somebody hit on the idea. It was actually a guy named Tom Erdman in Wisconsin who hit on the idea of playing an audio lure. Up to that point, they simply stretched their nets in the woods and left the nets open all night long and caught whatever owls happened to fly in. Now, it's, you know, your, your catch rate jumps by like tenfold if you're using an audio lure. But even passive netting, people like Katie Duffy, who was netting for many, many years at Cape May, she still was catching about 60 to 65 percent female owls with that with that passive netting. And it jumped to 65 to 70 percent female owls using an audio lure. Um, 
more recently, our colleagues Chris Neri and um, Nova McKentley up at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory on the UP of Michigan started experimenting using female vocalizations at some of their saw wet nets. And they found that they did catch a higher percentage of males at the female vocalization net than they did at the male vocalization net, but it really did not change overall the number of, owl, of male owls that they were catching. The, the male owls that we catch are almost invariably juvenile males on their first migration. And we think, and, and, and the assumption that we're, that we're making about the males remaining on the breeding territory, um, we know for a fact that in Europe, their closest relative, the, the boreal owl, it's known as Pelman's owl over there, does exactly that. The male boreal owls remain on the breeding territory. They find a territory in the winter where there's a high rodent population. They're basically, they're, 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 they're playing the odds. You know, they're a very small owl in a cold, snowy environment. There's a pretty good chance they're going to starve to death or freeze to death over the winter. But if they don't, they are perfectly positioned to intercept the females as they're coming north. Because remember, these birds aren't going back to a traditional breeding territory. They're just kind of roaming the landscape looking for a place where there's lots of food. But, but that's a great question. Now, the, the follow-up question, and then I'll shut up and take another question, is, well, why don't we use a female lure? And the reason for that is because um, we'd be changing our protocol and we wouldn't be able to compare the results we're getting now with the results we got in the past. So I, I encourage people who are setting up new netting territory or netting stations to use an audio lure that combines those both male and female vocalizations. When we started, there were no recordings that we could find of, of female saw wet owl vocalizations. Um, so um, yeah, so, but, but it's, it's, you know, that's a, that's a terrific question. And um, one that we've, we've given an awful lot of thought to. Thanks very much for that really complete answer. I just want to say to folks out there that if you do have a question, I've noticed some people using the raise their hand function. Please instead write your question to the Q&A button and we'll answer them from there. And here's another question. One of our listeners is wondering, are you familiar with the Delaware Otsego County area here in New York? And do you know if these birds are likely nesting in this area? I'm, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with it, but I can, I can, I can tell you that I, they certainly nest there, particularly after one of these big flight years. I mean, in the, in the east, they nest all the way down the spine of the Appalachians into, um, into North, and South, or North Carolina and Tennessee, parts of, of northern Alabama. Um, and they're, they're pretty widespread across the, mountain, the mountainous and forested parts of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, and we, what we often see in the years after these, these big flight years, um, and, and by the way, this year is looking like kind of an average year, not super big, not super, not super low, kind of in between. But you, you get an awful lot of like kind of spillover um, from birds that have flown south and look around and kind of go, hmm. This, this is a decent spot here. Um, and, you know, there, there is a, I, th I think across much of, of New York and the northern half, northern third of Pennsylvania, there is, you know, kind of a permanent um, uh, breeding population there as well. So, um, well, yeah, so and you, should, you should be able to find here it. Also, um, this is where our breeding bird atlas data comes in um, into play. Um, and I've actually pulled up the current uh, status for Sawwit Owl oh. and our confirmed and probable breeding in our territory. So you mm -hmm. can actually go onto this website and I'll share the link here um, in the chat in a couple of minutes and look at where there's confirmed or probable or possible breeding of that species. And you can pretty much do that um, with just about you know any any of our local birds, mm -hmm. um, and then this will also show the full species range. If you click around, there's other things that you can do to kind of get more information. But that's also you know if you want to know does something nest in our area, this is current data that's coming in right now that you can use as a resource. And I'd also say that. Um... Uh, some years ago in Pennsylvania, my, my, one of my colleagues, uh, now retired Pennsylvania Game Commission biologist named Doug Gross, launched something he called Project Toot Root, where um, 
he had volunteers going out and doing tape playback on randomly selected five mile sections of rural road across Pennsylvania. And the idea was, you know, every half mile you stopped, you played an audio lure, you listened for a response. And um, the first year, we did, it was a two year project. The first year um, they had sawwood owls on about 44% of the routes. Now this, this was primarily in, in mountainous areas. He wasn't doing this like in suburban Philadelphia. Um, but 44% of the routes had sawwood owls on them. The next year, about 48% of the routes had sawwood owls on them. And there was almost no overlap between the first year and the second year. They had shifted around so much. Um, again, there's, there's just not a lot of sight fidelity on the part of these birds. Question, will uh, sawwood owls use nest boxes? They will, they absolutely will, will use nest boxes. Um, interestingly enough, um, there was some research that was just published from the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania that suggests that predators may learn nest boxes really, really easily, and that um, it may actually be detrimental to sawwood owls to encourage them to nest in nest boxes. Now, you can get around that by putting predator guards on the trees where the, where the nest box is, but um, they were finding that, that, that uh, predators like fishers were really good at, like once they figured out where the nest box was, they just come back to it year after year. So they had um, the sawwood owls use the nest boxes the first year and then tended to avoid them in subsequent years, probably because of predation. Um, so if you're gonna put up a nest box, it's a good idea to put a, a you know, sheet metal um, predator guard on the tree below it to keep, um, to keep animals from climbing up there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit more about the MODIS network? I believe that there's a, a MODIS station in the Greenwoods Conservancy, which is uh, up in Burlington, New York, yep. right near here. Yep, and, it's one of the ones that we put up, as a matter of fact. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Does that mean then that we could see sawwood owl possible flights going by there? Well, it, it, if somebody is tagging sawwits, yes. I mean, it's only going to detect birds or bats or insects that have been tagged with one of these nanotags. And at the moment, there aren't that many people doing sawwit work. Um, there's a guy named Sean Craik in Nova Scotia who did some tagging a few years ago. Um, we did some nanotagging um, up at Petit Manan along the, uh, the Gulf of Maine and down East Maine a few years back. Um, these tags only last for a relatively short time, um, anywhere from a couple, of, a couple of months to maybe a year, depending on the, the size of the tag. Um, but um, yes, I mean, and particularly once we start tagging large numbers of sawwit owls here in another, another year or two, um, th there's going to be a lot of sawwits moving through that network. I mean, the reason we started the Northeast Modus collaboration in 2015 was specifically to build out an inland Modus network in the east so we could track sawwit owls. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, it was enlightened self-interest. Um, we got in a little deeper than we thought we would. We have two multi-million dollar U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grants to, that are allowing us to put up all these stations in so many places. But, um, and, you know, and of course, it'll track anything that's tagged as it goes by. But um, I'd really encourage folks to go up here. You know, I will put this in the chat. Um, the, uh, let me just make sure this is going to the right person or the right group. So it's www.motus. Dot org, modus dot org. Modus is from the Latin for movement. It's not an acronym for anything. And you can you can explore that site, and all of all of the tracking data is is publicly available, which is um, a really a remarkable thing in science. I mean, a lot of science is very territorial and um, proprietary, and the folks working in Modus have much more of a collaborative, um, let it all hang out approach. Scott, someone had asked if there is a place where visitors can uh, watch or assist in banding. So uh, it's, it's some places, I mean, normally, as I said, in, in non-pandemic times, we welcome visitors to, to some of our stations, mostly organized groups rather than just, you know, we don't, we don't have like a just come, just come and drop in kind of policy. Um, a lot of the banding stations um, are literally people working in their, in their backyards. Um, and would probably be alarmed if groups of people start show, <laughs> showing up there. Um, so it, so it, it, it varies. Um, 
you know, some of them, like, for example, Drumlin Farms, which is a big mass Audubon sanctuary in Lincoln, Massachusetts, they do public owl banding programs. I, I am not aware of any in your part of New York. Um, the Ned Smith Center in Pennsylvania, we, you know, does a, an annual Halloween owls program with a, with a banding demo where, you know, our banding crew sets up nets in the woods. And, um, we, you know, usually we bring, we have, um, you know, live non-releasable owls that are brought in from a local nature center that have them. And, you know, but then we're also catching live, live saw wits. Um, so, um, yeah, it just, it's, it's, it can be, it can be a little tricky to find that at a local level. So, so you can make a, make a road trip to Pennsylvania. Thank you. One thing I just want to let our listeners know too, Susan showed you the data for saw wet owls for the current Atlas which has only been going on for two years. If you do go to the website for the 2000 Atlas, which happened in 2000 up to 2004, you'll see that there are many more reports of saw wet owls. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of the, the, with the atlases, a lot of it comes down to the amount of effort people put into it. Um, when we did the, uh, the second Pennsylvania breeding bird atlas a few years ago, the Elk County up in north central northwestern Pennsylvania, almost every block in Elk County um, had confirmed or probable solid owls. And the reason for that is there was a guy in Elk County who made it his business to find solid owls in every single block up there. Now that's particularly good habitat. It's high elevation northern hardwood and conifer forest, but I suspect this, you know, with enough effort, sawwets could have been found in every block across all of the northern tier of Pennsylvania, and are probably much, much more widespread in New York than than even the Atlas data would suggest. You know, they're just they're they're really secretive. I have seen two sawwet owls that were either not in a net or not with a radio transmitter on that I was that I'm tracking. I mean, they're hard to find. They don't they don't respond vocally. Um, especially outside the breeding season, they, they don't respond vocally um, very quickly. You know, great horned owls will hoot back at you, screech owls will whinny back at you. Saw what owls generally don't. They're the smallest um, owl out there. They are at the bottom of the food chain. All the other larger owls, including screech owls, will kill them and eat them. So they're very cautious about making a lot of noise. Usually what you hear with a saw wet owl in the fall and winter is what's called the skew call, which is the actual saw wet call. It's this, it sounds like somebody dragging a file across the teeth of a, of a saw. It's like a Doesn't sound anything like that toot that people are, are listening for. And it may take 35 minutes of playing a saw wet um, tape before you get any kind of a vocal response at all. So um, you gotta, you, 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 got, you gotta be serious about finding it. We have another question about um, if they're at all viewable in the daytime. Um, they are, if you can, if you can find them. And the thing to do here is is um, understand what kind of phys physical structure saw what owls like. Um, as I said at the beginning, birders tend to associate them with conifer cover in the winter time, and they certainly will use evergreen cover. But it doesn't have to be conifers. I've we've seen them in mountain laurel stands in in rhododendron. Um, honeysuckle thickets, they love honeysuckle thickets, um, uh, you know, grapevine tangles, um, blow, deciduous trees that are blown down real dense, real dense blowdowns. Um, I've seen, I've found saw wet owls, I mean, these are for the most part tagged, radio tag birds that we can find. I've seen them roosting on the ground one day and then the same, the next bird, the next day, the same bird is 85 feet up in a pitch pine. Um, so the thing to do is look in really dense cover look for whitewash on the ground and then look up and you're looking for something that's about the size of your fist um, in a pine tree. It's, you know, telling a saw wet owl from a pine cone can drive you nuts. If you think warbler neck is bad, I'm telling you, saw wet neck is a lot worse. It, it's very straightforward to radio track the bird to the tree that it's in and then really, really difficult to find it in the tree. Um, but you can, you can certainly do it. And I, I know people who have gotten very good at finding solid owls. They just kind of develop a sixth sense for it, but you look for that, look for that whitewash, look for those pellets, you know, and then just kind of stand directly over the whitewash and look up and look hard. Um, but understand that they're often shifting their roost from day to day. 
the solid owls that we that we were radio tracking rarely used the same roost site more than one day in a row. What was interesting on multiple occasions, we discovered different radio tagged birds on the same roost on subsequent days. So, you know, you would find a sawwood owl on the same branch facing the same direction in the same tree as you, as you found yesterday, but it's a different owl. Um, and we started calling these magic owl trees because and it's like, there's nothing from our perspective, there's nothing that makes that tree look any different than the other 400 young white pines in this dense white pine stand. But to those sawwood owls, there was something about it that attracted them there. Um, and, you know, we, we crunched the numbers on stem density and canopy cover and all that stuff. And we just, we couldn't find anything that made those magic owl trees stand out. But, um, you know, the, the, the owls in, in fact, we had one tree where two different tagged owls and at least one untagged owl, because we didn't get any radio, you know, it didn't have a radio transmitter in its back. We're using the same exact spot in the same exact tree. Crazy. Beautiful. You well, can thank understand you why so this is. Much. Well, thank you. It's it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, I I hope I didn't bore anybody with going on a little bit too much. I can like I said I can talk about this stuff until your eyes roll back in your head. So um, so thanks. Get out get out this uh, get out this winter and try to find some solid owls. Get out this fall. I mean we're coming up on the it's probably the about the peak of the migration in in upstate New York over the next um, two two and a half weeks or so. It's, it's a very delayed migration this year because it's been so warm, but they are coming. And, you know, just, just get out there and toot and see what shows up. Nice. Yay. Well, right now we'd hear a room full of applause if we were live, which someday maybe <laughs> oh, we will you. be again. Um, I do want to ask people to please stay. We just want to um, have some final announcements and we want to announce the raffle winners and um, just formally close our evening for tonight. Um, and, yep, there's some thank yous coming in in the chat um, and I'll forward, I'll forward some of those to you um, at the end of the evening. Um, well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you all go. Thanks thank for you, having Scott. Me. Thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Enjoy your visit with family. I certainly will. Bye bye, everybody. Okay, bye. So for the um, the folks who are still with us and hanging in there for the end, I'm just going to run through a couple of quick announcements. Um, upcoming in November and December, uh, basically our eighth or ninth birdseed sale fundraiser raiser is going on now. Orders are available through the end of this month with pickup on November 13th at VC. VP Supply in Oneonta. Thank you to Jane Backman for her oversight on all of our retail programs, including the birdseed sale, bird-friendly coffee, DOAS mugs, reusable bags, and hawk watch hats. On Saturday, November 6th, um, Becky Gretton, Charlie Scheim, Sandy Bright, Rob Katz will be leading a bird walk on the grounds of the Fenimore Art Museum in conjunction with the Glimmerglass Film Days. And this walk will be a complement to the documentary feature film, The Falconer. Next month's program will be online on Friday, November 19th, um, Through the Eyes and Lives of Crows with Dr. Ann Clark. She is the Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Binghamton. Our trip, uh, Christmas bird counts, I have a separate slide for upcoming trips in January, our Eagle trip for members, will be on Saturday, January 15th, and our waterfowl count um, through the State Ornithological Association will be on Sunday, January 16th. Um, Christmas bird counts should be next. These are the dates for the Oneonta region. December 18th, contact Sandy Bright. Fort Plain on December 6th, uh, 26th, contact Bob Donnelly. Uh, Delaware County on January 2nd, contact Pam Peters. And now I will turn this over to Catherine DeVino. And Catherine, I have to move you back into moderators or just allow you to speak. Um, what do you prefer? I have to find the right screen. Participants, Catherine, where are you? Okay, well, I, I think um, 
yeah there you are allowed to talk Catherine can you speak there we go can you hear me we can hear you yes sorry about that that's okay um it gives me great pleasure to announce the winners of our virtual bucket raffle winners were selected tonight during scott's presentation and now without further ado the winners are the winner of the saw wet owl silhouette crafted by joel kazmierski is larry riley the winner of julie wexler's owl themed quilted bag is, and forgive me, Bob, if I say this wrong, Bob Brzezowski. I hope that was right. My apologies if it wasn't. Uh, the winner of the nature quilt created by Gretchen Adams is Suzanne Miller. The winner of the loon photo by Nina uh, Schock and framed by Charlie Scheim is Deb Miller. The winner of the great egret photo, uh, Candace print by Rob Katz is Again, forgive me if I don't get this correct. Nicole, is it Piantech or Piantech? I'm not sure. And then finally, the winner of the Eco Delight Oriole Feeder and Grape Jelly donated by me is Gail Dubois. The winners were selected for each bucket prize using a random number generator through random.org by Susan O'Handley. There will be a screen recording available of the selection process, which can be provided upon request for verification. Thank you to all who generously donated items, and thank you to everyone who who supported DOAS with a purchase of tickets. We sold a record number of 200 tickets this year, and that is just awesome. Prizes will be available for pickup at our birdseed sale pickup day on November 13 at BB Supply Corps, or by a special arrangement with me. It's also pretty likely that you might be able to pick up your prize from Jane Bachman's porch in Oneana and also pick up some bird friendly coffee while you're there. I will be contacting all the winners to arrange for you to get your prize. Back to you, Susan. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I just want to close things out. Um, despite the continuation of the pandemic this year, um, we've been very busy and we've been making changes as needed to programming um, just to react to whatever the current situation is. Our support from all um, all of you with memberships and donations throughout this past year has really been outstanding and we're so appreciative of that. Um, we thank you for your continued commitment to our vision of a healthy world where people and wildlife thrive and natural resources are protected and to protect our natural environment and connect people with nature to benefits birds and other wildlife through conservation, education, research and advocacy. Um, I would like to acknowledge our treasurer, Charlie Scheim, and Secretary Dorian Hunnicke for their exceptional work tracking all of the funds that come in and out and making sure that all of your donations are acknowledged. Uh, a special thank you also um, to Janet Potter, who's been working to administer our membership data for over 300 individuals and families in our chapter region. Um, we really hope that we can see you all in person in 2022, um, and we look forward to, to that. 